No, there we go. Oh, you did it already, Andrew. Okay, I guess double star. We probably threw off the algorithm now. It's gonna start. Yeah. start. <laughs> we'll do end end later. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be sure, we match yes. our parentheses, so to speak. Right? That's funny. All right, let me go ahead and do my sharing. Where is it? This one. Ooh, why is that still open? Let's close that. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is part two of the uh, initial value problem differential equation thing. Is a text big enough? Let me move this thing off too. Okay, there we go. Um, differential equations. And uh, we last left off. We were talking about the traditional Runge-Kutta methods, and now we're going to just add on to that to talk about adaptive Runge-Kutta. Where the basic idea here is that we we know that the you know we can develop uh, algorithms that are good to a certain order in the step size h, but we don't really know what that constant out front is. So we, it could be taken arbitrarily large in the amount of step sizes still. And so the idea here is to use an adaptive step size and we use a step size that depends on how fast the uh, derivatives are changing in that particular area, uh, more or less. And the way it works is you estimate, you take a step size in uh, similar to what we did before, right, with adaptive integration, we want to like estimate the error somehow. In this case, um, we have we we can do that by taking a step at a fixed step size, take a step with two algorithms of different order, and use the difference between those results to estimate the error. And that's what this equation is saying here. So we take uh, a step with two algorithms, one of order p and one of order p plus one, one order higher, and we estimate the error as the difference between those two. Um, uh, outputs the two estimates of u, uh, which he calls here u twiddle being the more accurate estimate, one order higher, and u without the twiddle being the estimate um, at the order p. And so this becomes our local error estimate, right? What's the error we made right now? We're just marching forward one time step. Our estimate, I would add, or we actually don't know the real error, but this is an estimate. And best you can do now is say, okay, well, if that est if that's bigger than what our tolerance is what step size should we have taken? And this is where we use the um, convergence or the consistency criteria that tells us that these things should be of order h to the p, right? And that's what he's doing here. He's saying, okay, the local error should be ordered h to the p plus one for the higher order one. And so if we reduce the step size by a factor q, we would expect that error to go down by q to the p plus one relative to what it was before. That's what this is saying, right? So what are the errors before? We can reduce it to order by reducing the step size by order Q. And so just setting that equal to epsilon, we just solve and say, okay, that's the step size. We should use the step size is QH, where Q is given by this expression, uh, one over P plus one. Now he does make the point that that's the local error. So maybe we should go one order higher or lower than how you look at it, uh, because we really care about the global error, which we know should be equal to something like H to the QH to the P plus one divided by QH or QH to the P. And that gives us this, um, goal here to reduce step size by this equation here. Um, in the text, he says this kind of uh, vague statement that experts are divided. I don't know if he took a survey on what is best, uh, but then he also says that modern practice seems to favor this first formula with the one over P plus one. I don't know. There's not, I don't know if he didn't give a citation for that, but that's fine. You need to use one of the, or the other of these formulas uh, and make a choice. So the outline of how this should work then for an adaptive algorithm is to first produce estimates, pick some step size H, and then uh, produce your estimate using the two different uh, algorithms, one of a higher order. If the error estimate from the difference between those two is small enough, then go ahead and adopt the uh, uh, u twiddle as your solution value, and then increment T. Go ahead and move forward, march forward another time step. If it's not, then don't adopt it and don't march forward. But in either case, you still go ahead and reduce, not reduce, but replace, which could be increasing, change your step size by this factor Q. That could be increasing it if you found your epsilon, your, your estimated error is much smaller than epsilon, then hey, you, your step size is too fine. So I did accept it in that case, but now I'm going to increase my step size uh, going forward because now I'm in a, maybe in a smoother part of the function uh, H or F or whatever it's called in this thing. F, I think is what it's called, the derivative. So, and they just keep marching forward in that way. And so he gives, now there's one thing here right away, you're like, well, that's gonna require a lot of function evaluations for the derivative function. We probably don't want that. 
And it turns out that people have discovered these embedded algorithms, which allows you to use a fixed number of a smaller number of uh, function evaluation and use those same function evaluations uh, in two different ways, two different arrangements, two different sums to get two different order results. And these are the embedded algorithms. And this is what the algorithm is. I don't know if you remember how these things work, but down the, this isolated column to the left here is the, um, well, each one of these rows tells you what that what that K value, K sub one, K sub two, K sub three, K sub four is in the Runge cutter algorithm. And the isolated things here in this section are the, how much you move the time step and the things over here are how much you add in the previous k's. So k1 is always just whatever the function is valued at the initial point. Then k2 at this point will be a half time step forward and then using one half of the previous k, right? And so on and so forth. I mean, it's in the book. It's hard to, to describe very well for me anyway. I'm having trouble with it. So it's in the book. But this just tells you this is a shorthand way of presenting the algorithm. The key part is the bottom two lines here. The, this first line tells you how to construct the second order estimate using these, these the Ks that you've computed up here. And this last line tells you how to construct a fourth order estimate using those same Ks. And that's the that's the key idea of these embedded algorithms. This one's called the Bogaki Champagne or whatever. I don't know how you pronounce it, but BS. <laughs> it's how it says. The BS3-2 or BS3 because it's a third order, second order uh, system. Uh, he calls it RK23 in the... Uh, algorithm that he presents, but that's what this Julia code here does. It implements just that. I'm not going to walk through it, but I just put it here so I could use it for the exercises. Um, if anyone has questions, if anyone else who walked through this, they'll have questions, this would be a good time to jump and say, hey, what is that for? Um, and I will try my best to ex to explain or be befuddled with you, at least <laughs> for those two things. Let me know. As always, just interrupt me if I'm rambling along. Uh, one, you can see here that the, he actually uses those coefficients to calculate the second order solution. And then he calculates the error directly by just taking differences. So he's written out the difference rather than calculating the third order solution here to calculate the error. What's interesting is when he does accept it, he actually uses the second order, not the third order as it says in the algorithm. It probably doesn't make a big difference since it's there, there should be differing only by epsilon at that point. but. I thought that was interesting. He chose to do it that way. Maybe it's just a little more efficient that way. Uh, there's another interesting thing here is that he, when I said before, what can happen is, right, as you get to a smoother part of the function f, this function f, this that describes a derivative, ivp.f, when you move into a smoother part, you might start to increase the step size too fast and just jump right over some interesting bits. So he, this is what this right here limits how fast the step size grows after you get out of a rough region, as it were. And, all this does is just keep you from stepping past the end of the <laughs> one step past where the end point is. Uh, the only other thing to note here too is he, uses, he doesn't quite use max error over E to the one over three, he uses 0.8 times that just to make a little more conservative on the step thing. So that's all just choices you can make to optimize these algorithms. So let's just look at this for an example. Uh, example exercise 6.5.1 asks us to solve this uh, differential equation using the BS formula. Uh, y double, y second root of y, well, there it is. I don't want to say it out loud. Between zero and two pi, and then plot the results uh, for y and its derivative, and also and also plot the time step as a function of t, so we can see what's happening there with respect to the adaptive uh, formation. So there's four different initial conditions, and they start out either a point, they all have to start at the first derivative of zero, but then they start out closer and closer to one, um, where something might interesting might happen because of the way this equation is built, you can see, right? And uh, so, of course, like usual, we have to convert this to a second, uh, two first order equations because we don't. That's how we solve second order equations. So I do that. I define v equal to y prime, and actually I use u one as y and u two as the velocity v. And I just write out the equation. Hopefully, I didn't make any mistakes there, but it should be yeah. I write out the equation as this f, uh, write out the t-span, uh, tolerance they told us to use uh, one to the 10 to the minus eight. And then I just write all these four equations. They're all the same except for the initial conditions. So I can just quickly write them down here and evaluate all that. Hopefully it works. Then we can solve them with that function we just defined, which actually is fairly quick. Julia for you, right? It compiles everything, so it's fast. This was Python, that for loop would probably take us a little while to go through, I assume, in R as well. 
And I just defined my own little function here to plot the solution. So it's, I don't have to write the same code over and over again, right? Don't want to repeat myself. And so here's your problem A. Uh, whoops, sorry, it jumped down on me. Fusion Studio Code does that to me. I don't know what, why it does that. It's something I have to fix, but um, it, you can see in this case, it quickly finds a time step and just kind of hovers around the same time step because the solution is relatively smooth and consistent. With that initial condition, with, this, with the initial condition closer to one, it starts to have this little spiky behavior. And when it gets to that spiky behavior, you can see that it starts making a smaller time step, but not much yet, right? Uh, for C, it gets even spikier and it starts making a bigger difference. Now it goes down to like a 10th of the time step during these spiky parts. It isolate, you know, oscillates around a little bit, but that doesn't seem to matter. And then finally, for the hardest one of all, um, it actually goes down by two orders of magnitude on the uh, on the time step during the, the big spikes. And, okay, well, I mean, I don't know, is it doing it right? I don't know. So the only thing I can compare to is just use the TSIT5, which is the correct, the best one to use for these types of problems going to the Julia differential equation package. So I did that and it looks similar. Oops, sorry, but I was going around a lot. It looks similar. I don't know if this is a plotting thing or not where the derivative goes up uh, higher. Maybe we've got better points in there. But as far as the Y itself, this plots both of them together and they're, they're spot on. So our adaptive, uh, our, our RK23 algorithm seems to be doing um, just fine on, on, on this problem anyway. We could have investigated this a little bit more, but that's, that's I think, a good start on that. Um, I also want to say something about what TSIP5 is because that's what I used here. TSIP5 is another one of these same kind of adaptive algorithm. It just uses a more sophisticated, or I use a different, you know, where is this thing? I use a different one of these, because one of these has more orders, so it's a 5-4 rather than a 3-2 order thing. Um, and the Julia documentation has the reference. I think I have a reference for it in here toward the end. I think I talked about the end of this thing. So that's that kind of helps with the mystery of what TCF5 is. It's an adaptive runge cutter system. That's with, and it's an embedded one as well. It's another pair. They call them an embedded pair. They found a fifth order and a fourth order pair that somebody found and wrote a paper on, and probably was very exciting. <laughs> and that people use it. Okay, so that's that um, type of method. Now uh, the RK method, runge cutter method, is used multiple the one they're a single step method they update you one time step later whatever even if that time step's changing but during that process they may use many evaluations of the function f which is again a derivative right these methods the multi-step methods instead use many previous values of u as well as f but many previous values of u to calculate the next it doesn't just rely on the previous value of u it has to have it uses many other previous past values of u for each step. Uh, to express that succinctly, he introduced this shorthand where f sub i means f evaluated at time step sub i and at the value that you had at that time. And so these, the types of methods he's gonna talk about here are called k step, k step multi-step methods, particularly these are linear methods because they depend linearly on f and u. And this is the general form of them. So it's some u sub i plus one will depend on the previous value, but also potentially on more previous values in the further past and as well as on function evaluations during all those previous times and previous past times. If um, uh, one of the things it mentions is that this VK is zero, then the method is explicit. Otherwise it's implicit because otherwise it would act, U F of I plus one, it re requires knowing what U sub I plus one is. So that would mean solving something to be able to solve that's called an implicit method. Uh, the explicit methods are straightforward. This provides the algorithm you need to do it. All you need to do is find some ways to fill in all the other starting values because you only have the initial value, so you have to use something else. Usually some kind of RK formula is used to uh, evaluate and determine what all those other initial values are that you need to get the thing kickstarted, right? But once you've kickstarted, if it's an explicit method, it's pretty straightforward to, to do. Um, so the text gives some, so well, what are these constants? Well, again, that's one of the things you have to work out with Taylor series and there's various different ones you can use. Um, some of them, the, he gives examples of these Adams bash forth methods, which are explicit multi-step uh, methods, as well as these Adams molten methods, which are implicit. Um, so he derives these in the text using Taylor series and it's in the text and I'm not gonna try to reproduce it here. Uh, one thing I wanna point out though, is that in, 
in the process of doing that, he introduces this local truncation error, which is defined in a similar way as it was for the Runge-Kutta methods, where you're looking at, um, uh, again, the difference between what the derivative should be and what you're, say what you're saying it is from your approximation. And he says if the uh, LTE is order h to some power p, then your method has an order of accuracy, order p, just like before with the Runge-Kutta methods. And if P is greater than zero, then it's a consistent method. And that's important. If the method is not consistent, it's not going to be much value to us. So he talks about uh, implementation of these things. So this is an example implementation of an explicit animal. I didn't put this in here, but of an AB4 method, which he gives us, again, just using constants that somebody found and that he derives in the, in the book. Uh, as well as an implicit method. So the implicit method he just gives for this AM2 method, which is the lowest order implicit. Well, not the lowest order would be like the implicit Euler, right? So it's the second order um, uh, implicit method that he gives. So the, the trick here, again, is that you have to find, so Z is actually going to be the next, the U, the I plus one. But now it depends nonlinearly on, on, on that, on U, and which is now called Z in here, because now it's a root finding problem. He's going to find the root of this equation, Z. So, uh, and he does that. Uh, in this algorithm by just using, uh, you know, Lemver Marquette uh, uh, root finding algorithm. So inside this thing, every single time it finds a time step, it has to now also find a root. Um, so right away you say, wow, why would anyone ever do this? This sounds absurd because now not only do I have to like calculate all these evaluations of F, I also have to do a root finding thing and who knows how many iterations that's going to take, right? So that's, the. it turns out that the reason he says for this, and it's something he hasn't explained fully in the text as I could totally grok, was that there's these, there exist problems that are called stiff problems where the um, explicit methods are unstable and the implicit methods are stable and will work essentially. And there's more about this in the Julia documentation on the differential equations, but that's about the, the best I could get. I've understand that, understanding that, but he does give an example. He says there'll be some more about this in chapter, oh, chapter 11, there'll be a complete mathematical definition, which, which is chapter 11, I think is actually on partial differential equations, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, diffusion equation. So hopefully we'll make sense of it there. But I have seen this before in the wild. And I know that's the thing that where there are some problems that just won't respond well to, um, to explicit methods. So he gives a demo, and this is from the text, uh, the demo that he gives. I just wanted to reproduce it here. Uh, the problem here, I guess you can see, is that F has this difference between U cubed and U squared. And whenever we see a difference, we're always reminded that, hey, this could probably lead to problems because we're going to have numerical overflow numerical issues where we're taking differences of two numbers and right and, the, and those differences could be the size of the uh, machine precision so we define this problem oops so thanks stop scrolling um and what did i plot here so first we solve it with this implicit am2 method we just talked about um i guess i must have defined that did i define these things how does that work just make sure, yeah. And this is what the solution looks like. It starts out small. The, at some point around uh, t equals 200, it rapidly changes state up to, to 1.0. This is kind of a call mark stiff problem where it's relatively constant for two phases and when one part, it just like rapidly changes very, very quickly. And if we try to do that with the explicit AB4 method, um, it just loses track completely at the point of the, of the transition there. So it just goes, it just goes terribly wrong as the text says. Uh, well, we could use a finer time step and that's what we do here. So we just take the smaller and smaller H's. And sure enough, as we take, if uh, we take a time step of a thousand, it like oscillates like crazy through this part. If we take the time step of 1600, finally it starts to settle down. So it requires 1600 points, whereas the AM2 method only required 200 points, the uh, more stable uh, implicit method. So that's the that's the why you would use an implicit method for these kind of problems, even though it would seem more costly. It turns out for stiff problem, it's less costly to do this root finding thing. Why that is, I don't understand. I'll be honest with you. I don't. Did anyone else really understand why the implicit method would be more stable? I feel like I used to know, and then I started. <laughs> uh, I mean, I just felt like well, it was because of the that rapid change that you're talking at that point 200 or what is it 205 yeah no i mean we see that it is 
more stable. I just understand like what makes an ex implicit method where it's using the previous using the current value in the right hand side and then derivative helps keep it under control somehow, right? So that's something for I mean to uh, to investigate or remind myself of if I didn't know it at one point in my life. But anyway, that's uh, something. Oh, well, he also said again, this is something maybe in chapter eleven somehow we'll make clear. I don't know. Hmm. That promise will really come through or not, but if it doesn't, oh, there's a whole section in there about stiffness. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> there is some stuff in there about eigenvalues and things, so that makes sense. Okay. Oh, yeah. I had a oh. question about the Julia code for the the first function in this section. Which one is that? Which for which the uh... one more. Uh, yeah. This Maybe. line twenty one. They yeah. mention what does the dot 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 mean? If I remember correctly, I think that's like a splat operator. In... I think they try to explain it in the text, but I didn't really understand. I thought it was a splat operator, but I'm not 100 sure either. I don't know what that means. It like turns a a list into a, a full. A, if this is a list, it'll splat. It'll like um, turn into function arguments. I'm not sure that's what it is, though. So maybe I should try to explain that too hard. <laughs> yeah, if you look up splat, I right know. Did it did try to explain that in the text? I think. I think they did. They said, "Let me let me find the quote." I mean, I think that's what it's for. Hang on, let me just try something here real quick. Oh, I forgot to get this thing a name. It says, <laughs> this line computes F sub I based on the most recent solution value in time. Okay, that's the IVP part. That and go, goes into the first spot of F, followed by the three values that were previously most recent. Right. So I, yeah, it's, I think that's what it does. Let me just double check this here. So if I have a list like this, I want to pass both of them in as arguments to this function. I think you can do that, yeah. So that's what, what it does, it unpacks. So this function takes two arguments, right? Uh, X and Y and adds them together. So I call it this way, I get one and two, I pass in. Uh, it adds them together. Here I have a list of two things. I want to turn those into function arguments, unpack them, and stick them in. A, so now this list becomes two arguments. Why? I guess I didn't understand why it said followed by the three values, but then they have it index one to K. Like, yeah, it's not just three, right? It's whatever. <laughs> I agree with you, okay? <laughs> I guess I should try Yeah. It. Well, that's because, right, so this is a list, and it doesn't want a list of lists, so it's unpacking these additional new parts of this list. So I, I guess you could do the same thing, right? So um, let's see. If I want like a one, two, and then I, I want lists, and I have somewhere else, I have this list three, four, I don't know where it came from, but I want to just stick them in there, right? I get they just unpack into the list as well. So that's what's happening here is unpacking this into that list. Maybe it should be called the unpack operator. I don't know. Or what what do they call it? Flatten something. Is that what he calls it? I don't know. It's not I think in R they there's like a flatten list function or something. Tidyverse. Okay, that makes sense though. But it doesn't quite match what the text, the three. I think the three thing was also not. I was like, how are they? Anyway. Yeah. yeah. So that's what that does. It comes in, I guess it comes in handy quite a bit whenever you have something like something returning a list and you want to turn it into an argument double essentially or into a it unpacks it, turns it into a naked sequence, I guess you might call it. <laughs> okay, where was I? 
I don't remember. Oh. You're on adaptivity. Right. Let's forget about what I don't know about how stiff problems are, because that'll come back later, hopefully. <laughs> um, adaptivity. So this is just a comment that you know you can take, uh, just like with the RK method, is possible to run two of these. Uh, implicit or explicit methods in parallel. Sometimes I've seen cases in Julia documentation where they seem to have methods that do both an implicit and an explicit somehow to use it, compare the two to make kind of adaptive things that can detect if something's stiff or not auto automatically. Uh, it, did you say it is more complicated here because you have to have multiple previous values of u for each time step. So what they tend to do is interpolate all those previous views to calculate what it would be for the other new time step that you might choose. Uh, so this last section, or is this the last section? I'm not sure. This next section talks about um, zero stability. So we know that for the one-step methods, we have a theorem about this, you know, these things converge. If they're of order P, they converge of order P if as long as they're um, consistent, right? That's that theorem 6.2.7, which I've forgotten the details of. But the point is that we know that they converge. Let me just remind myself, that was way back there. Yeah. So we know we know those systems will will be fine, right? But the problem with a multi-step solution like this, we actually have a higher order difference equation. So in a higher order difference equation, we can actually have more solutions. Just like with a higher order um, differential equation, you can have multiple solutions as well, right? So we can have more solutions, and some of those solutions might be unstable as the step size gets to zero. So we need a new new criteria that our methods have to satisfy, and that criteria is called zero stability. And it's just defined as being that if if the as the step size goes to zero, every solution produced by the method remains bounded over the time interval of interest, then it's zero st just stable. And without that, we can see that we'll, any any kind of error. He gives a demonstration. Any kind of error. He gives a demonstration in the text. I don't put it in here. Any kind of round off error, something like that, could just amplify. You know, we're on the, the solution we actually care about by activating, as it were, this other solution to the higher order difference equation. And so then he has a number of these Dahlquist theorems. He has it relate to that. But the most important of it is this thing called Dahlquist equivalence. And that is if a any linear multi-step method will converge, that's a strong statement, to zero if and only if it is consistent and zero stable. So that means that Consistency, which means it has it goes to zero as a step size. Remember, goes to zero. Uh, the LTE goes to zero as the step size goes to zero. And then zero stability are necessary and sufficient conditions. So we know that it has those two capabilities, and we also know it's going to converge. You know, to H, as H goes to zero, it doesn't tell us how necessarily again what the big constant out front is, but that's promising. Uh, it gives a second thing uh, theorem first Dahlquist barrier that says the order of accuracy of a K step. Uh, method is bounded by this, I guess that's the barrier part, bounded by k plus two if k is even, and it's k plus one if k is odd. Um, I don't know, and k if the method is explicit. I don't know what um, the significance of that is. I guess that means you want to use an even case when you're doing an implicit method. I don't know. I didn't really, that kind of went, I'm like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> but what, why do I care about that? You just kind of threw that out there. Did anybody else get anything out of what the purpose of that was? No, but no, if, no. if K is, if you use the odd, like one, oh wait, no, never mind. Okay, yeah, no. I yeah. guess you would want to do even. Or like if K is four and, and then five, then P is bounded by the same number right okay yeah that make, now that that does make sense so that's kind of the point of it i guess you might as well go ahead and go to the next one out right or not bother if you're at four don't go to five it's not going to buy you that may not buy you that much not that's what he's saying right it might but it may not there's a barrier there okay any event that's the main bulk of this chapter i don't know if anyone else had anything else they wanted to talk about about this uh chapter one thing I just wanted to kind of like as an aside talk about at the end here is the <clears throat> Julia's solvers, uh, the differential equations.jl package. And if you go to this site, 
you'll find that there's a large number, like just page after page of methods that you can use. They recommend this TSIP5, which again, like I said before, is a, this be like, yeah, it is a 5-4 uh, embedded, just like the 3-2 we did, but it's 5-4 higher order uh, method that we did before uh, as the default method. Oh, uh, here's the reference if you're ever interested. You can just look up this, um, this guy. T Sid is the name, the first part of the guy's name is T Sidoras. I don't know if that might be Greek. Uh, so anyway, that's his big one of his big claims. Who knows? Maybe it's the other big claim. That was 2011, so it's relatively recently developed that he found this uh, nice pair of of, uh, of uh, RK methods that work well together for this. And for stiff problems, they recommend the Rosenbrock 23 or the TRBDF2. I don't know if these are anything like the methods that we've talked about in the, I assume they must be implicit since they're being used for stiff problems, but I, I don't know if they're anything like what we talked about in the text, but that's what they recommend. There's a whole, but they do have all these other algorithms, including many of the ones that we used here uh, in the in this text. Uh, even Euler is in there if you want to use uh, <laughs> Euler for something. And sometimes you do want to use Euler because you have like stochastic terms or something like that and you can't easily uh, deal with uh, multiple function evaluations. So that was essentially it. I, I just wanted, there's one other thing I wanted to point out about that. The T-SIT thing, did I put that in here? No, you can't see it in here, but let me see if I can do this. That's the right function. How do you find the thing? Oh, use not to find anymore. Well, it's not called you, it's called um, T6. So, well, let's see here. So here's the R adaptive thing with the three two. It needed 5,000 points, okay, to do this solution. And now just for comparison of the, so that's our three two method. Now this five four method, I guess T would work too, fine. Find, find Google, or not Google, Copilot. <laughs> uh, 66 points, that's a huge difference for going up. We went up two orders though on the algorithm. So uh, that's, that's pretty amazing <laughs> to me. So Pays, that guy's invention in 2011 was, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> so that's the only thing I wanted to say about that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let me stop. Oh, thanks so much, Ron. That was, yeah. a, that was dense. <laughs> yeah, it was very dense and I left out a lot still because um, he really likes to go and I guess it's important, but I don't want to say it's not important to me, but it's not, I don't really have the uh, bandwidth right now to spend a lot of time trying to understand the details of the convergence of all these mm -hmm. algorithms and the Dahlstrom stability barrier. I'm sure I'm going to forget all of it. I already don't even know what it is, so it's going to be very easy to forget about. The only thing I do wish I understood more and I will want to look into is the stiff versus non-stiff because that does come up a lot. And I only ever had like, just this vague idea like, oh, maybe it's a stiff problem. <laughs> yeah. Switch the algorithms. That's on my list of words that I didn't understand in context of my new literature search of this new project I'm starting on. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So it'll come up, right? <laughs> yeah. Lot. I mean, as far as we know, the only definition you give this so far is that a stiff problem needs an implicit method. <laughs> but yeah. It tells you, you know, I guess that's kind of a weird way of defining it. But yeah. Cool. So I think I'm up next on matrix analysis. Probably yeah. will be much things we are much more familiar with. <laughs> Looks kind of short, five sections. So yeah, um, I'll try to get some good, good discussion going. Yeah, I look forward to that. Um. Okay.